The National Book Awards are given out tonight in New York City, and among the nominees is the new biography, Will in the World, How Shakespeare Became Shakespeare. Renee Montaigne spoke to its author, Harvard Humanities Professor Stephen Greenblatt. Writing a life of William Shakespeare is a trick because almost nothing is known about the man, so linking the man with the work involves lots of speculation. The movie Shakespeare in Love was pure speculation. In his book Will in the World, Stephen Greenblatt offers a scholarly tale that weaves the plays and poems into a coherent narrative that rests on a paltry set of facts. Among them. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford. He moved to London, where he prospered as an actor and part owner of a company of players. When he died, he left behind neither books nor writing, except a few signatures and, most notoriously, his second best bed. He left nothing actually at first to his wife of thirty-four years, and then someone must have said, "Come on, you've got to leave her something." And so he instructed the lawyer to write,、uh, as an addition to the will, that he would leave her his second best bed. Well, well, Not a very sentimental farewell. Well, actually, I would say rather something of an insult. It sounds to me、uh, like an unhappy marriage, relieved only by the fact that they didn't live together for most of the time. One of the things I try to tease out, in fact, in my book, is the peculiarity of this person who seems to have been able to represent anything that he wanted,、uh, having so few marriages in his works that have intimacy,、uh, happiness. Although, of course, when you come to the poems, the sonnets, you do find the ability to have a very strong passion. Ah, love is another matter entirely. He's the great poet of courtship, love, making love, wooing in the English language and possibly in the whole world. This is、uh, the person who gave us Romeo and Juliet and lots of other astonishing moments, including the sonnets, which are full of passion for the young man and for the dark lady. It's the marriage bond that he seems to have shuddered at, and I don't even speculate. I speculate about everything in my book, but I don't actually come up with a speculation for who the dark lady was.、Uh, I have no idea. I think he was quite clever about avoiding direct personal revelation all his life. Well, I think he had reasons for it. Why? He probably had, even as a young man, a life experience that led him to think that concealment, personal concealment, and then. Its flip side,、uh, showing yourself through putting on masks and disguises, was a good way of being. His, I think, the family was tied in secret ways to Catholicism,、uh, the religion that had once ruled England but had been displaced by Protestantism. It was dangerous in the 1580s to be allied to Catholicism, and I think Shakespeare, as a young man, learned habits of evasion and concealment as well as performance. So, if William Shakespeare, as a young man, was raised in a family that was secretly Catholic, that would contribute to a personality who that would not reveal itself. That finds displaced and cunning ways of revealing itself rather than direct. It doesn't take.、Uh, Shakespeare is very good at, in general at staying out of jail, which wasn't so easy if you were a playwright. What do you mean playwrights ended up in jail in his day? Well, this is a country that's much more, shall we say, like Stalinist Russia than it is. Like the United States, all plays have to be shown to the censor before performance. All texts for printing have to be shown to a different censor before they go to the printing house. It's a time in which the government was worried about anything said in public, and there's a lot of attention. If you if you are drunk at a tavern and begin to run off the mouth about the government, you can wind up under investigation and in extremely unpleasant circumstances. Shakespeare's contemporary Christopher Marlowe was a mad risk taker and wound up with a knife stuck. Through his eye, probably by a government agent in a tavern. These are risky times.、Mm-hmm. Shakespeare understands very well that they're risky times, and is very good at dealing with them. He's actually quite playful about it. It's not that he lives in shaking and in fear. He just is clever about it. He takes lots of risks in a subtle way in his work. Let me give you an example. At the end of *Midsummer Night's Dream*, remember that the fairies go tripping through the house and they say they're going to sprinkle field dew on the bride beds. Well, what's that about? What it's about is that the old Catholic Church used to sprinkle holy water in the bride beds, and then the Protestants said it was superstitious, so the practice couldn't be done anymore.、Uh, but the fairies in Shakespeare's comedy sprinkle field dew instead, and there's lots of that in the plays. Lots of sly, funny allusions to the set of beliefs that had been outlawed. Of all the examples that you either, you know, imagined or derived from what what we know, is there a favorite that you could tell us、uh, that just 
is a link between a moment in the plays or the or the sonnets. Shakespeare came to London and entered a world of competing rival playwrights, almost all of whom had university degrees, degrees from Oxford or Cambridge. He didn't. They must have looked down on him or uh, regarded him as a country bumpkin at first. Then, fairly quickly, he must have begun to alarm them because the most uh, flamboyant of that group, a man named Robert Greene, a wild man, took notice of Shakespeare. Robert Greene was a kind of scoundrel, but he had degrees from Oxford and Cambridge. He had grown his hair, he had red hair, he'd grown it into a point at the end of which he hung a jewel, so you can sort of conjure him up. And he had, ma he had uh, abandoned his wife and children and taken up with a prostitute named M. Ball and her brother, uh, thuggish brother Cutting Ball, who was eventually executed. Uh, anyway, on his deathbed, Robert Greene attacked Shakespeare as the upstart crow, beautified with our feathers. So two things about Shakespeare's response to this. First of all, almost ten years later, Shakespeare writes Hamlet and he has Polonius reading a letter, an intercepted letter of Hamlet to Ophelia that's addressed to the most celestial and beautified Ophelia. And Polonius looks up and says, beautified? That's a vile phrase, beautified. Beautified is that insult that Greene had delivered almost ten years before, beautified with our feathers. But the other side of Shakespeare's response, and that the one to which I'm deeply attached, is that Shakespeare clearly took this wild, scoundrelly, brilliant, uh, extravagant uh, Robert Greene and used him, transformed him, into the character of Falstaff. Stephen Greenblatt is the author of Will in the World, How Shakespeare Became Shakespeare. Give me a cup of sack, boy. A plague of all cowards. Give me a cup of sack, you rogue. <laughs> is there no virtue extended? 